Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast. This podcast is all about farmer's markets, how to increase your market business success, and in our current climate, maximize safety while providing people with fresh food. Farmer's markets are essential. Whether you're a farmer's market manager or a small farmer or food maker selling at farmer's markets, you have found just the right podcast. This week, we're revisiting a talk by Brent Preston, farmer and author of The New Farm, recorded live at Intense the Farmer's Market Conference in 2019. We invited Brent because I was such a fan of his book, a memoir of his 10 years farming on the front lines of the good food revolution. Many of our attendees that year found that his talk really turned some ideas on their heads. What if one of the best ways to reduce food waste and still feed more people well is to grow less food? We hope you enjoy hearing Brent here as much as we loved hearing him speak live on stage at the conference. One more thing, because 2020 was, well, 2020, we've pushed back the dates for Intense, the Farmer's Market Conference, by one month. The plan is the same. The fifth annual conference will provide the very best content to help you make your farmer's market business less stressful and more profitable. The only difference from what you've heard lately will be that we'll be coming to you live online March 15th through 18th instead of in February. Yes, one month later so we can make the conference the best it can be. The good news is early bird pricing has been extended to the end of January for those of you who are waiting to register to include it in this year's budget. This year, we're looking forward to sharing more Tent Talk Live recordings with conference attendees who register for the Learn and Grow ticket to the 5th Annual Intense, the Farmer's Market Conference 2021. I think I've said that name enough that you're going to remember it, right? That registration level includes a full year of content, including sessions that will be recorded during March's event, extended tent talk interviews, monthly member messages, and more. You can register today at farmersmarketpros.com. Now let's listen to Brent Preston's insights and prepare for another year of building a better food system in 2021. All right. Uh, everyone can hear me okay? Um, Kat, thank you very much. And uh, um, Justine and Bridget, I really appreciate being invited here. As uh, Kat said, it's cold where I am. So I, I really, really appreciate you uh, inviting me here. Um, this is what my farm looks like right now. I threw this slide in this morning. It's, this actually wasn't taken today, but uh, this is sort of what it's like. I talked to my wife this morning, and the buses have been, have been canceled for two days in a row. And my wife and daughter have been holed up in the house, not being able to go outside. It's, it's getting to be like the shining up there, it sounds like. Um, and just for, pers- for perspective, these hoop houses that my kids are leaning up against, the peak of them is 16 feet off the ground. And this picture was taken in March. So it's, uh, it can be pretty diabolical in the winter. Uh, but the, the summertime is really lovely. Um, I'm just going to give a quick overview of our, our farm and, and where we are. Uh, but we're a certified organic vegetable operation. Our biggest crop is cut salads, and our biggest customer is, is uh, restaurants. But we do sell to, uh, to retail stores as well. Um, the farm is 100 acres. Uh, it's on the crest of the Niagara Escarpment, really beautiful part of Ontario. Uh, and we have about 20 acres of garden uh, about half of that is in production in any given season. Um, we're we're uh, in the Collingwood, Cremor area. Our little village near us is called is uh, Cremor. It's famous for its beer. We had the first microbrewery in Ontario, so that's how everyone in southern Ontario knows about us. But we're uh, about an hour and a half drive from downtown Toronto. So we have a population of close to 9 million people within a two-hour drive of our farm. So we're really lucky to have a big market to have a big, prosperous, uh, multicultural, thriving city on our doorstep. Uh, and a lot of our food uh, ends up going down into the city. Uh, quickly, I've tried to figure out different ways of giving the backstory really quick. But uh, my wife grew up in Vermont. Uh, and lest you think this is just a generic representation of beautiful, the beautiful hills of Vermont, that was her house right there. She grew up on a, on a sheep farm um, outside the village of Williamstown. <laughs> I grew up in suburban Toronto, and lest you think this is a generic representation of suburbia, that was my house right there. Um, we, uh, th- our, our suburb is called Scarborough. Um, Mike Myers is from the same suburb, so if you've seen Wayne's World, you know where I come from. 
Uh, we met working overseas. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I didn't want to. Okay, okay, okay. Um, we met working overseas. Uh, my wife and I both worked for many years, uh, primarily in Africa, on human rights and democratic development work, working for international NGOs. Uh, we met in Malawi in, in the early 1990s. Um, this picture was taken in East Timor in uh, 1999, uh, these pictures, and uh, we almost got killed there. So um, after a really great career of working overseas uh, in international development, we decided to settle down and have kids, uh, and we moved to Toronto. And uh, we, had, we were normal people in Toronto. We had jobs. Um, I worked in journalism, and, and Gillian was a management consultant. Uh, we had a couple kids. We had a nice house. We had lots of friends. We did normal urban things. And then um, after our second child was born uh, in 2003, we started to get this nagging feeling. And I don't know, you probably don't get this down in the States, but we, ha we had this sort of this overall feeling that things weren't really headed in the right direction. <laughs> like that, you guys, you, you guys probably never, never felt that. Um, but uh, even, even that back then, 15 years ago, we were thinking, you know, there's a lot of really big problems uh, that we're facing. Uh, we saw it in, in our lives in the city, um, social is isolation, loneliness, um, really big problems with human health, so many people we knew getting cancer, so much problems with obesity and diet-related illness, and um, then all of the environmental problems that we're seeing all over the world. And the biggest one, of course, was climate change. And there's so many stats, uh, climate change stats out there, but this is one that, that really affected me at the time and really um, still hits home for me. So when I give talks uh, to, at universities, for example, often in the audience, there isn't a single person who was born before 1985. So we've got decades of time where we haven't had a single month where the monthly global average temperature was below normal. Um, so as, the, as these stats started piling up uh, in 2003, uh, Gillian and I decided that we had to do something about it. And we didn't really know what, but we somehow came up with the idea of buying a farm. <laughs> so we bought this farm completely on a whim, not really being able to afford it. Uh, it was 100 acres, completely run down, hadn't been farmed intensively for a long, long time, really crappy house. We found a big, huge snake living in the attic. Like, it was, it was pretty rough. But we made this leap with uh, uh, kids who were one and three years old, and we moved out of the city, and we decided that we would start a farm. You know, it's becoming a more and more typical story. Um, so we, from the beginning, we... We, uh, because we came from a human rights and democracy kind of background, uh, because we were moving out of the city um, in response to all of these problems that we're seeing, we started out with some really core values that we identified at the very beginning uh, that we wanted to guide our farm and our business. So sustainability, obviously we wanted to farm in a way that was sustainable, that was going to be environmentally sustainable, but really critically we wanted our farm to be financially sustainable. So both of us were committed to this idea and our goal was to have a farm that supported both of us 100% on the farm which we didn't realize at the time was a totally unrealistic goal. Uh, we wanted to um, grow really high quality food. Uh, we wanted food that was going to nourish our friends and our community members uh, and the people who bought it. And we wanted to build community around our farm. So we wanted to be a uh, our farm to be a place where people could come together around food, where we could build community, um, build connection, and, uh, and uh, combat some of this loneliness and isolation that we're seeing all around us. So in, but in addition to these three uh, ideals or three principles, we also had one rule. And it was uh, similar to a rule that Charlotte was talking about yesterday when she was talking about identify your ideal customer. So we had the same rule, but it was, we flipped it on its head. So our rule was that we wouldn't work with assholes. <laughs> so because we are finally running our own business after working for other people for many years, and because we wanted this business to reflect our values, we, are, we decided from the beginning we were only going to work with people who shared those values. Uh, and there's nothing more satisfying than firing a customer who's an asshole. 
so we, we launched the farm um, after being on the farm for a couple of years. We launched the business. This is our very first garden in 2007. Uh, it was, we plowed up part of our front lawn because it was the only place we could get uh, water uh, to the garden. Uh, it was less, less than a tenth of an acre. And we embarked on creating the, you know, the absolute stereotypical small vegetable farm. So we grew everything you can imagine. We started out with a uh, Elliott Coleman hoop house made out of electrical conduit and plastic uh, in the backyard. Um, we grew, ev we, we raided the seed catalogs and bought every kind of weird s vegetable seed you could imagine, some of which you can see were kind of terrifying to our children. It was a sp uh, spiky Armenian cucumber. Uh, we grew uh, multicolor beets, uh, you know, all different colors of cauliflower, every variety of tomato that you can imagine, uh, carrots. We did everything with a uh, walk-behind rototiller. That was the only piece of machinery we had because we didn't have any money, and, we, and Elliot Coleman told us you could manage three acres with a walk-behind, so how hard could it be? Uh, <laughs> we planted everything with a one-row push seeder. Uh, this was taken a few years later when we um, actually had a proper uh, greenhouse, but you can see... Uh, up against the edge of the greenhouse, that's snow piled up there. So we're trying to get uh, an early crop in in the spring. Uh, we thought, oh, in a small farm you need to have animals, so we bought pigs, uh, we bought 100 laying hens, uh, and we sold eggs at the end of the laneway and wherever else to the knitting club in town and anywhere else we could, uh, we could figure out to sell them. And then every Saturday morning we would pack up our pickup truck with as much stuff as possible, and we would drive 10 minutes into the village of Cremor, and we would sell everything at the farmer's market. And it was a beautiful farmer's market. It was uh, weekenders from the city, retirees, people who had lived in the community for five or six generations. And it was an absolutely amazing way to become part of the community as newcomers. People could see who we were. They could understand what our role was in the community. Our kids would run wild through the village uh, while the market was going on. And it was an absolutely idyllic, wonderful way to join this new community that we found ourselves living in. And when we would meet our farming neighbors, because all of our neighbors were farmers and they're all conventional farmers, uh, we would explain to them, you know, we're, we're practicing this new kind of agriculture. Uh, we're serving the local market. We're building community. We're, we're um, helping the environment. We're doing all these great things with this new uh, kind of agriculture that's really going to make everything in the community better. And when they looked at us and looked at what we were doing, they didn't actually see all the things that I just showed you. Um, what they saw was this. <laughs> now, most of the farmers in our community had seen this all before. They had seen waves of people leaving the city and moving to the country. And, you know, personally, I think if you want to take off your shirt and put on your white jeans and hook up the horse, you know, more power to you. <laughs> but that's not what we saw ourselves at, as. Um, and when the, the people in our community would, would look at us and see what they were doing, they would always say something that was a variation on something like this. What you're doing won't feed the world. And this is a way, uh, in one sentence, to dismiss all of the ideals and all of the theories and all of the, the um, goals that were behind what we were doing. And I'm sure all of you, whether you're a market vendor or a manager or a farmer, have heard something like this before. Something that says that what you're doing isn't serious. What you're doing is a trend. What you're doing is not going to have a significant impact. And when we were told this at the beginning of our farming career, um, we thought maybe they're right. I mean, we didn't really have any idea. Um, and it was kind of terrifying to think that maybe we were promoting uh, a form of agriculture that was going to lead to mass starvation. Like, nobody wants to do that. <laughs> um, so it really got us thinking. And it, we realized the longer we lived in this community that the reason people said this and the reason that this was the general idea among the population that organic farming can't feed the world, that small-scale farming can't feed the world, is because big agriculture has promoted this message over and over again for decades. So when you look at the websites of all the big um, agricultural input companies, uh, they're full of statements talking about how we have to feed the world. The purpose of 
chemical intensive monocrop agriculture is to feed the world. It's the only way we can feed this growing population that we have. So we see this message over and over again and it's been deeply internalized by the mainstream farming community all over North America and in much of the world. And it's pervaded out into the general population and it's become really, really pervasive. The message is always we need more food. We have more and more people uh, rising standard of living around the world, we need more food. Well, we started really thinking about this as we were just in the early years of our farm and trying to think ab about whether or not this was true and what it meant for the kind of agriculture that we were trying to practice. Now, uh, the, the little red dot there covers the whole, what's now 20 acres of our, of our um, production land on our farm. And this, this, uh, this picture is somewhere around 10 miles across in each direction. And up in the top right corner is the little village of Cremor where we, uh, where we go to the farmer's market. In all of this area, as we, we sort of got to know the, the community better, we realized that the farms were almost all exactly the same. They were all producing commodity crops using a lot of machinery and a lot of inputs. So uh, fuel, fertilizer, pesticides, lots and lots of inputs. And really, they're only producing five things in our neighborhood. Corn, soy, wheat, canola, and hay. All of those things are being traded on the international market. Our neighbor down the, the road, Bill, who grew soybeans, he'd get up every morning and check the soybean futures um, coming out of Chicago. And sometimes he'd forward sell his uh, beans to a buyer in Japan uh, two years in advance. He's selling his crop. Um, from two years from now, already sold to a buyer in Japan his soybeans. So it's a completely internationalized market. And what's we, what we realized when we talked to all these farmers and looked at the, what they were growing is that you couldn't actually eat anything that they were growing. You know, none of this was actually food. All of it had to be fed to animals or processed before uh, it could be consumed. Now. You, uh, all of, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, all of you know this, but it really, um, as new farmers, struck us that the, the, uh, when, when these um, farmers and uh, big agri agricultural companies that were selling them things were saying we need more food, what they're really saying is that we need more meat, sugar, and processed food. Because that's what was being grown, right? So. Everything in the whole community around us was going to make, you know, generally these three things. Now, it's really easy to get behind the idea or the slogan that we need more food. But if you put it in these terms, um, it becomes less defensible. Because I don't think there's many people who think that we need more meat, sugar, and processed food. So, I was really curious um, as we started discovering this and thinking about it, uh, about what the consequences of these of this um, this production production of these kinds of foods meant, and really curious about this basic idea of um, the kind of agriculture I was practicing couldn't feed the world. So I did some research, and it was actually a little bit surpri surprising how difficult it was to cobble this all together. But from various sources, mostly from the United Nations, um, I looked around, and generally uh, around the globe, there's a lot of variation in calorie requirements. But generally, the consensus seems to be about 2,600 calories a day for men and 2,000 for women. Uh, but according to, uh, and then if you weight that by age and gender, by the sort of global population of, uh, um, around the world, you come up with a really rough average of around 2,100 calories a day. This is, this is rough, but it's somewhere in that neighborhood. But according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, in 2013, we produced al there was almost 2,900 calories available for every person on the planet available at the household level. Now, a lot of people look at this stat and say, this is skewed by massive overconsumption in developed countries, which is true. But even in Africa, in 2013, there were over 2,600 calories available for every citizen at the household level. This is, these are calories that are available in the house. This is not, um, you don't have to subtract anything for food waste or um, the ability of people to buy it. This is through surveys of what is available in the house to eat. So we can see that even in a, a place uh, like Africa, which we often associate with hunger and malnutrition, we have an overabundance of calories. And 
all, everything that I've been able to find and read says that since 2013, the availability of calories on a global scale has increased everywhere. So what are the consequences of this? Well, the first is obvious. Um, according to the British journal, Medical Journal, The Lancet, uh, obesity now kills three times as many people worldwide as malnutrition. Mm -hmm. So when people, when people um, talk about the need to continue to produce more food, it is just a simple, uh, well-documented, easily accessible fact that we have too much food and that that uh, and too many calories and that is causing massive problems uh, in terms of human health. Um, whenever, when, when, I, when I give this presentation, there's always people who say, wait a minute, um, obesity may be a big problem, uh, overeating is a big problem, but hunger and malnutrition are still a serious problem that we need to deal with in the world, which is totally true. And I have some experience with this. So the first job I had working overseas uh, in the early 1990s when I had uh, different color hair and more of it, um, was working as a volunteer on a food distribution program in Malawi. So uh, in uh, 1992, Southern Africa experienced the worst drought uh, in more than 50 years. There was a big mo international mobilization, uh, food was donated, and I worked, I volunteered for an NGO to help with the distribution of that food in Malawi. Uh, this is 40 tons of American maize that we were giving out in a village uh, in rural Malawi. And we would uh, organize people to, uh, to uh, um, hand out the food and people would come who are identified by the government as, as being um, eligible to receive food and we gave out food. And when I came back from that experience after about a year in Malawi, people always asked me the same thing. They said, what did you eat while you were there? And it always struck me as a bizarre question because while I was there, I ate whatever the hell I wanted to eat. I went to the supermarket and I bought food. I went to restaurants in the city and I bought food. There was food available everywhere. The problem was not that there was an overall lack of food. The problem was that poor farmers had lost their crops and therefore they had nothing to eat and they had no money to buy food. And this has been true for all time and is true all over the world. Hunger and malnutrition are economic problems. They are symptoms of poverty. They are not a symptom of a lack of food. So, Increasing the food supply on a global scale is going to do zero to address hunger and malnutrition when we already have a superabundance of food. So, what are the consequences of this overproduction? When you start to look at the problems of our, our food system as problems of overproduction, a lot of the problems that we see start to make sense. Um, the first of all that we talked about is obesity, and with that we get a huge rise in chronic uh, disease and spiraling healthcare costs. In countries like Brazil, healthcare costs are threatening to overwhelm the government. Uh, and we're seeing this in, in, I mean, obviously here and in lots of uh, developing countries as well. We have environmental problems, marine dead zones in rivers and lakes and oceans caused by agricultural runoff. Uh, we have um, agriculture is the primary driver of habitat loss around the world, which is the primary cause of the mass extinction that we're seeing uh, going on right now. Uh, we have dis ecosystems being disrupted at the, at the whole ecosystem level uh, through uh, our pesticide use, the collapse of insect populations uh, all over the world. Um, the, the uh, economic effects of overproduction means that food uh, becomes really cheap, Farmers have to apply even more chemicals in order, order to uh, try to make ends meet. They have to increase mechanization, increase farm size in order to try to chase ever, ever um, thinner margins. Uh, and we have the, the epidemic now of farm foreclosures and bankruptcies. Uh, that leads to rural depopulation and, and the uh, hollowing out of rural communities. Um, and then we have top soil, soil loss, desertification, something like 30% of our agricultural lands have already been desertified in the last 50 years. Uh, and then the problem of food waste. Uh, I'm not an expert on food waste, and I know we're, we, we've been talking about that through this conference, and we're going to be talking about it more. Um, but it seems to me that, th that one of the primary drivers of food waste must be that food is so cheap. You know, how often do you hear someone say, oh, that filet mignon I had in the back of the fridge, I just forgot about it and it went off and uh, I had to throw it out. You know, we waste food 
uh, because we don't value it, because it's so cheap, it's so easy to replace. Um, I always remember in the farmer's market, people coming and buying a $5 bunch of carrots, which in the, you know, 10 years ago was a, was a big deal in our community that someone would send it, sell a bunch of carrots for $5. But when people bought those, they would always talk to us about what they were going to do with them. They were buying them for a specific meal. They were saying, oh, I've got company coming over, so I want to get a salad and some carrots and tomatoes, and I'm going to serve them a salad tonight. People were intentionally buying valuable food to do something uh, special and important with it. And when you go to Costco and buy a giant flat of whatever and throw it in the freezer, it doesn't have the same value and it tends to get wasted. But of course the biggest problem with our food system, or I think, is the way it drives climate change uh, and um, environmental degradation. So this is all super, super depressing. Um, I don't know, if, is anyone here familiar with the Eat, uh, Eat Lancet Commission? Anyone? I, I really urge you to look at this. This is a, a brand new report that came out last month. Uh, it's a, uh, a European-based group. The Lancet is the uh, medical journal in, in England, and EAT is an is a, uh, academic organization in, uh, in Sweden. Uh, but they assembled a panel of 30-something scientists with the goal of coming up with a scientifically defined diet that would provide ideal human health and ideal planetary health. So looking at how can we eat in a way that is gonna optimize human health and the health of our planet. And I think this is an incredibly powerful quote. The glo global food production is the single largest driver of environmental degradation. And you know, w we know this, this is, this is the, the really um, depressing part of our work is we're faced with this reality all the time. But the, this commission flipped this idea on its head. And they said, if food is the biggest problem, it's also the biggest opportunity for change. So food is the single strongest lever to optimize human health and environmental sustainability. The one thing that can have the biggest impact on all of these big food system problems that are all of our big um, human problems, all of our big species problems. So after sort of learning about all these things and thinking about them for a long time, we decided that we needed to flip this idea on its head. So we don't need more food, we need less food. It's a totally different mindset. Um, but saying that we need less food is not a great rallying cry to get people to start changing <laughs> things. So really we need better food. This is the simplest way that we can, that we can put it. Um, so what does what does that mean for a small farm like ours if we want to produce better food? Well, after about three years of farming, we had got to this stage, we had about 12 acres of land in production. Uh, we'd been farming with uh, unpaid interns. We'd been producing primarily for the farmer's market and growing a really big diversity of crops. And we realized that if we were gonna grow better food and we were gonna contribute to a better food system, that we needed to make some changes. And primarily we needed to make sure that we were economically viable, that we were a real business. So we set out to do that. Uh, we did a few things. First of all, we specialized in the things that grew well on our farm, did well on our microclimate, that we enjoyed growing, and that sold well. And for us on our farm, uh, those things were cut salads, cucumbers that we grew in our uh, greenhouses, uh, multicolor beets, and specialty potatoes. So we started streamlining and focusing on those things. We had sold in the farmer's market for three years. We never started a CSA, but we looked around and all small farmers who were trying to do what we were doing seemed to think that these are the only ways you could sell your food. So we, started, we said, we need to diversify our markets if we're gonna make money. So we started selling to restaurants, which is now our most important market. Uh, we started selling wholesale, and, and Kat mentioned we, we hooked up with a really innovative wholesaler called 100 Kilometer Foods that I can tell you more about later, uh, who um, took our food, they, they built their business on going direct from farms to restaurants in Toronto. Uh, we started selling to a home delivery company, which was a huge, huge opportunity for us, an organic home delivery company. We did a, a value add salad dressing. We just started adding all of these different outlets, all of these different ways to sell food to diversify our markets as much as possible. 
We professionalized our workforce, which was um, probably the biggest, uh, the biggest um, change that we made. So we got rid of the unpaid interns. Um, unpaid does not equal free, we discovered. And uh, we hired uh, a crew from Mexico. So Juan Carlos and Schwen and Luis, who are on the, on the end here, uh, three brothers from central Mexico who were the core of our team who started with us seven years ago, and they're coming back for their eighth season this year. Uh, and we, uh, I j just before I was here, I was down in Tlaxcala visiting those guys. Um, and uh, I, 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 I can talk more about the program. It's a, it's a very heavily regulated government program in Canada, all legal. Um, um, but they completely transformed our, our, our productivity and our ability to produce a, a large volume of food. Uh, and we really focused on the soil. So we started a very uh, intensive cover cropping program. I'm a total cover crop geek if anyone wants to talk about it afterwards. Uh, but we came up with all kinds of different mixes to drive uh, fertility and carbon into our soil and to uh, improve the productivity of our farm. So after about five years of doing this, of specializing our products, diversifying our markets, professionalizing our workforce, and really focusing on soil health, we discovered that we had actually achieved a lot of our financial goals. Uh, after five years of farming, uh, we became profitable. Uh, by year seven, we had paid off the mortgage on our farm and all of our farm debt. Uh, after five years, Gillian quit um, the off-farm work that she'd been doing part-time. And for the past seven years, the two of us have worked 100% full-time on the farm with no outside income. So we did, thank you. <laughs> so we realized that by sticking to our values, refusing to work with assholes, and really honing our business model, we could actually find uh, a model that worked uh, and made sense for us. So at this stage, we are faced with a question. In, in business, most people uh, you know, would say to us at this point, you're profitable, your sales are growing, uh, everything's clicking, you know what you're doing, this is the time to really cash in, to grow, add more people, add more land. We had lots of land, we had 100 acres we could expand onto. Um, but this idea that bigger is better is what got us into the problem in the first place. So we made the conscious decision that we were going to stop growing and we were going to focus on the things that made us happy and that built the movement. Um, so by, by um, stopping growing, it freed us up to do a lot of other things. First of all, we built an on-farm event space so that we could bring people together and build that community and teach people about this kind of agriculture. We call it the New Farm Kitchen. Uh, it's got a commercial kitchen and, uh, and uh, space for people to eat. And that really transformed our relationship with our chefs, who could now, our chef customers could come to the farm, they could do pop-ups, we could do fundraisers and events, and it really made them uh, much more loyal customers. This is a guy named John Horn, who was executive chef at Canoe, which is probably the most iconic restaurant in Toronto for the past two decades. He brought all of his staff, his dishwashers, his front of house, his cooks, and they weeded lettuce for a whole day with us because he wanted his whole staff to understand how we produced the best salad mix that he'd ever worked with anywhere in the world. So it really, um, by opening up our farm to people, it really um, created those relationships and created loyal customers. We started getting all sorts of tours. This is from a university in Toronto. Uh, all kinds of people coming up to find out what we're doing and how we're doing it. We wanted to fight this idea that the kind of food we were producing was elitist and inaccessible. So we started raising money for good food organizations. Uh, this was one of our early fund, uh, fundraisers for the Stop Community Food Center, a really innovative uh, organization in a low-income community in Toronto. And this little fundraiser, we would ask our chefs to come up and cook. They all volunteered their times. And it, com it quickly grew into something pretty big. Uh, so now we sell 1,000 tickets. And when we put those online in the spring, they sell out in less than five minutes every year. We get 15 of the best chefs in the city coming up and cooking for us. And then we have a band uh, that plays in the barn at the end of the night. And um, we've managed to get some really great bands. The, the cheesy bands we have in Canada, like Celine Dion and Justin Bieber, we send down to you guys, and we <laughs> we uh, we keep the we keep the good ones for ourselves. So the the Canadians in the room will know who these guys are. Um, uh, and then we we end up raising a lot of money. So uh, we now consistently raise uh, 
clear over $150,000 in one night at this event uh, because we have really amazing sponsors who want to be part of this. Again, no assholes, all, all uh, people who are really committed to companies that are committed to building a good food system. Um, and the stipulation is that the money is used to buy food direct from organic farmers for uh, community food centers uh, around southern Ontario. So we're creating relationships with other farms. Some of the money is used to buy food from our farm, but most is from other small farms. And the stop sets up a farmer's market in their food bank where, where clients can come and pick and choose what they want of all fresh organic vegetables, exactly the same quality that we send to our restaurant clients. So in the past 10 years, this will be our 10th year running this fundraiser, we, uh, this year we'll clear a million dollars in fundraising for good food organizations. So, thanks. Now, the other thing that not growing has helped us do is it's freed up a lot of land on our farm to do things other than grow food. So whereas um, agriculture is a destroyer of habitat and a destroyer of species, we've now got 80 acres that we can create habitat and create space for other environmental services. So we planted over 10,000 trees. We've seen a huge proliferation of wildlife come back. Um, we, uh, we get snapping turtles wandering through the garden all the time. Um, <laughs> and our, our farm has become this incredible haven for pollinators. The farm is literally buzzing. There's so many pollinators around. And to see that transformation over the last 15 years has been really incredible. And the last thing I'm going to talk about really quickly is uh, the next step. We've completely drunk the regenerative Kool-Aid. We are absolutely committed now to trans transforming our farm from an organic farm to a regenerative farm. And we're doing lots of different things, but one of them is uh, to reduce tillage. So uh, just really quickly, we did an experiment last summer where we started using really large tarps to kill salad stubble instead of uh, tillage as we've done in the past. So we could take a weedy, stubbly mess like this after we've har harvested our salad, cover it with a tarp, and two weeks later it looks like this. And so we can plant directly into it without disturbing the soil, without doing any tillage. And the results have been absolutely amazing. This is our last planting of lettuce last uh, spring, and you can see where the edge of the tarp was uh, when we did this experiment. Um, same variety, uh, same planting date, uh, everything uh, ready more than a week earlier than usual. So any farmers in here want to talk about that after, I've got a little presentation I can show you. Um, and then uh, a couple, couple years ago, we decided as part of this mission to spread the word and to, uh, to build the movement that I would write a book. Uh, so the book has been, has, has been a lot of fun, and it's, it's opened up our opportunities to come to places like this to talk to all of you. Um, it's, a, it's a national bestseller in Canada, and uh, we got a publishing deal in the U.S. last year, so it's out here now. And we just sold the movie rights, which is really weird and terrifying, but uh, <laughs> could be really fun. So, so just in conclusion, um, I, I, wanna, I want to... Uh, I know all of you have had that experience where you have been... Uh, talking to a market customer or talking to a conventional farmer in your neighborhood or talking to your conservative uncle at Thanksgiving uh, and they say something um, they say something that makes you feel small you know something that makes you feel like what you're doing isn't real um, isn't going to have an impact uh, isn't going to feed the world and just remember that that's not true you know, what we're all doing is the only thing that's going to feed the world sustainably. If we're going to really transform our food system, we all have to be pulling in the same direction and we all have to be working toward the same goal. And that's creating uh, a food and agricultural system that nourishes the land, that regenerates our soil, that feeds our communities, that brings people together uh, and creates community. Uh, and we all need to be pulling on this lever the single strongest lever to optimize human health and, uh, and global environmental health. So uh, I'm super excited to, to uh, answer questions and to be here, and I'm really proud to be part of a, a group like this, so thanks very much. Farmers markets are all about community, and all of us, operators, farmers, and vendors, keep learning. To learn what's happening from people just like you in various parts of the country or share what's happening in your area, we have terrific conversations and people sharing resources over in our private Facebook group, 
the Farmer's Market Pros community. Please find us there, answer the three qualifying questions, and join the group. You can also message us on Instagram at Farmer's Market Pros or send us an email at connect at Farmer's Market Pros.com. If you're just getting started in Farmer's Markets, check out our Vendor 101 online course. And to go deeper, register for our annual Intense the Farmer's Market Conference live online March 15th through 18th, 2021. Learn more at FarmersMarketPros.com. Thanks so much for listening to Tent Talk. Please leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you access your podcasts and tell us and others how you're enjoying Tent Talk. If you're listening on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss our next episode. Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market podcast is proudly produced by Farmer's Market Pros, where passion meets profit. Today's episode was recorded and edited by Justine Marzoni Mead. Original music by David Mead. Thank you so much for listening today, and we'll have another great episode next week. Tune in.